As a species, human beings strive to do great things. We wish to see our name in lights, to have our talents recognized, and to live out our dreams. At the very least, all humans deserve a degree of recognition, even if it's just from our friends and family. Someone else to know who we are, remember our name, and the good things we bring into the world. As a result, passing away in anonymity is a terrifying and tragic concept. Luckily, advances in technology have helped us shed some light on those who have passed away without a name, bringing some closure to their stories. In today's episode of Cold Case Detective, we'll be exploring four cases of Jane and John Doe's who were recently identified. Michelle Garvey. On July 1st, 1982, the body of a white woman was found in Baytown, Texas. Described as being a young woman between the ages of 15 and 20, she had blue eyes, curly red hair, and a scar on one foot. She was around five foot one to five foot three inches in height and had one ear piercing. Jane Doe was wearing mostly brown clothing including a long sleeved button down shirt with a distinct piece of embroidery on the breast pocket, which showed a horse and corduroy trousers. Authorities determined that her body had been disposed of in the field where she was found just hours after her death. She was discovered near the bodies of two other unidentified people who have since been dubbed the Harris County Does. Jane had been sexually assaulted. Her shirt was unbuttoned and she had no bra or shoes and she had been strangled to death. Although attempts were made to find the young girl's name, investigators quickly grew short on leads and the case turned cold for several decades. In May of 2011, Jane Doe's body was exhumed for DNA. An online sleuth who frequented the website Web Sleuths came across the recreation of the girl and thought she resembled a missing teenager from Connecticut. The sleuth passed this information on to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, as well as the Harris County Medical Examiner. Then in 2014, Jane Doe was given back her true identity after her DNA was compared to that of her sibling. Her name was Michelle Angela Garvey. Michelle was born on June 3rd, 1967 in Jersey City, New Jersey to her parents, John and Patricia. At the time of her disappearance, she'd been living with her parents and her older brother, Sean in New London, Connecticut. She was last seen alive on June 1st of 1982, where she had run away from her home, aged just 14 years old. It was believed that she had attempted to either run to her birth state or travel to North Carolina and according to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, she had a lengthy history of running away, although further details about why she did this and what her home life was like remain unknown. It is also unknown what Michelle's last movements were after running away. Her family reportedly thought that she had fled and started a new life without them. Investigators believe that she escaped from her house through a window and then hitchhiked in an attempt to get to her destination. And those still working the case are aiming to find out just how she ended up in Texas and why. Michelle Slaying is suspected of being connected with the infamous Texas Killing Field murders, although investigators have not announced a definitive connection between the two. Michelle was buried in March of 2014 in Montville, Connecticut. Her case remains open and has gone unsolved for 38 years. David Stack. On June 10th, 1976, 
The body of a young, white male was found in a landfill near a water treatment facility in Utah. The young man was estimated to be between the ages of 17 and 21, was 5 foot 9 inches, and weighed around 170 pounds. He had wavy, shoulder-length brown hair, a faint moustache and beard, and brown eyes, and wore a tan or grey shirt, black belt, and jeans with patches on the knees. He had no shoes. He also had several distinguishing marks on his body, a white scar on his forehead, a vaccination scar on his left shoulder, and another on his left wrist. John Doe's right foot also had hammer toe deformities, meaning that the tips of his toes pointed downwards. This was possibly from wearing tight-fitting shoes, but could also have been caused by other factors. Since he carried no identity, investigators could not determine the young man's name, despite asking around the area. They did, however, find out that he was last seen alive in the nearby town of Wendover in Utah at around 3pm the day before he was found. However, after this, John Doe's case began to fade from the public spotlight and was ultimately closed due to a lack of leads. He was buried at a local cemetery. During the early years of the investigation, many of the details in the young man's case were kept under wraps. It wasn't until 2010 when his profile was entered into the database of the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children website that various features of the case were released. For example, it was never before told to the public that John Doe died from two gunshot wounds to the head. Four years later, in 2014, his case was officially reopened. Two detectives had gone to a cold case conference and learned of new ways to collect DNA and dental samples, which had prompted them to re-investigate John Doe's death. A new forensic facial reconstruction was also created and released around this time, and displayed to the public, although it sadly appears to have brought forth no new leads. Then, in 2015, a big break finally came. John Doe's dental records were found to be similar to that of a missing teenager. As a result, his body was exhumed, and DNA evidence was extracted and compared to his potential relatives. On August 11th, that same year, it was announced that, after 39 years, John Doe had a name. He was David Arthur Stack of Colorado. David, or Dave to his family, was a 19-year-old who had graduated from New Milford High School in 1975 and had seven siblings. Upon hearing the news, his youngest sister, Diane, said, We always hoped that it was something better than it ended up being. While his brother, James, added, I always thought he went to Alaska. Dave was loved by his family and apparently was the most popular sibling with lots of close friends. He loved rock concerts and parties, and was described by his siblings as charming and charismatic. In 1976, he decided to hitchhike to California to see one of his siblings. He was last seen on June 1st at his family's home in Broomfield, Colorado that year. It is unclear if his family later filed a missing persons report, as they seemed to believe that he had made it to his destination unscathed. When they didn't hear from him again, the family bandied about many different theories, including that he'd started a new life, that he'd moved to Europe, or that he had developed amnesia. In recent interviews, the siblings stated that they had looked for him most of their lives. After he was identified, Dave's body was transported back to his family to be reburied. The investigation into his death is still ongoing. Patrice Corley. On the morning of April 19th, 1990, a pilot gas station employee was shocked to find the partially clothed body of a young woman near a dumpster behind the bustling truck stop at the side of Interstate 70 in Hebron, Ohio. When police arrived on the scene, they found the victim of a grisly murder. Jane Doe, who was later dubbed the Licking County Jane Doe, had been brutally beaten to death and suffered severe blunt force trauma to the back of the head. 
All her clothing was missing except a pair of underwear and her jewelry was gone. Investigators suspected that it had been stolen and theorized that Jane Doe was a sex worker. The gas station where her body had been dumped was known for always being busy, frequented by travelers and truck drivers. Because of this and Jane Doe's lack of identity, police did not feel greatly encouraged that they would solve this case. They felt there had been too many people in and out of the area and they likely would never be able to trace the perpetrator. During her autopsy, it was found that Jane Doe had given birth at some point in her life, which fueled investigators' determination to find her name and her killer because they said she was somebody's mother and somebody's daughter. They also found that she had been discovered within 12 hours of passing away. She was described as being five foot two and 110 pounds with a small mole on the right side of the bridge of her nose and another on her right cheek. She had brown eyes and reddish brown hair. The most crucial piece of evidence that was found, however, was the male DNA located in Jane Doe's underwear. A partial hit on this DNA led investigators to travel down to Iowa in the summer of 2013. But this lead was a dead end, as a second DNA test on the suspect showed no match. A family in South Carolina then came forward, believing that Jane Doe was their missing mother, but this was also proven to be false. Shortly after her autopsy was completed, Jane Doe was buried outside of Newark and was given a granite headstone by a US Marine veteran and Church of Christ minister who had the stone inscribed with Jane Doe and the date of when she was found. It wasn't until August of 2017 that Jane Doe's true identity came to light after her sister-in-law filed a missing persons report in 2016, which led to a DNA match. Jane's real name was Patrice Anita Corley. She was a 29 year old mother of one who was last seen on December 4th in Kentucky in 1989. In the months following her disappearance, Patrice's sister-in-law had attempted to file a missing persons report, but was told that she couldn't because she was not a blood relative. After she was identified, investigators received what they called significant leads in Patrice's case, but so far her slaying has gone unsolved little is known about her life. The only suspect in the crime is the Ohio prostitute killer, an unidentified serial killer suspected of being a trucker who went by the name of Dr. No over CB radio. It is believed that he preyed upon sex workers from 1981 all the way through to 1990. Police continue to work on Patrice's case. Anyone with any information at all is encouraged to contact the Licking County Sheriff Office on 740-670-5555. Anne Lehman. It was August 19th, 1971, when a man and his young son were taking a stroll in an area off Redwood Highway in Oregon searching for mushrooms to collect. The area, known locally as a dumping site, was near mile 35 along that stretch of road in Josephine County and close to the California-Oregon border. As the pair searched, they saw something underneath the debris and soon realized they had stumbled upon human remains. The unidentified girl found at the scene was estimated to be between the ages of 14 and 25. She was five foot four and weighed around 125 pounds. Her hair was auburn with blonde streaks and thus authorities dubbed her Annie Doe after the character in the musical Annie. She wore a pink and beige checkered coat, jeans and a tan and beige long sleeved turtleneck sweater. Her shoes were a size eight and a half and were brown leather with square toes and gold buckles. Annie Doe also had several pieces of distinctive jewelry, one braided ring with a mother of pearl stone in it and the letters AL sketched on top of the stone, as well as a silver ring that investigators thought was a promise ring or a friendship band. 
This ring had the initials MH stamped in it. In her possession, Annie Doe carried 38 cents in change and a map of recreational sites in California. Her cause of death could not be determined. Due to the map that the young girl was carrying, investigators suspected that she had been on a sightseeing tour, possibly with her family. They also considered it a possibility that she had fallen victim to the Zodiac Killer, who was active at this time. However, these were the only theories that authorities had, and it became difficult to determine anything without the true name of their victim. While there was a brief glimmer of hope at one point early on in the investigation, when Annie Doe was thought to have been a missing person from Massachusetts, this lead quickly died out. As a result, the case began to grow cold. Then in 2017, isotope testing was carried out on Annie Doe. Authorities discovered that she likely came from the northeastern US or Great Lakes region. They also had a new composite sketch made up of the young victim. A year later, the DNA Doe Project took her case, and after 48 years, Annie Doe was finally identified. Her name was Anne Marie Lehman, and coincidentally, her family called her Annie. She was a 16-year-old who'd gone missing from Aberdeen, Washington State in the winter or spring of 1971. Her older sister, Virginia, remained there, and it was her DNA that was used to make the match. Annie was born in August of 1954 to Norma and Albert. Norma was originally from England, and several of Annie's relatives had been traced back there when the DNA Doe Project was searching for her true identity. Annie's father, Albert, was an alcoholic. She apparently suffered an unhappy home life, which is thought to be the reason that she left. She also had a brother named Alan, who was just four at the time of her disappearance. Unfortunately, by the time Annie's true name was uncovered, he had passed away along with their parents and half-sister. It's unknown if Annie was ever reported missing, and the circumstances surrounding her disappearance are also undetermined. According to the lead detective on the 16-year-old's case, her sister, Virginia, told them that she recalled seeing Annie pack her things up one day. When she asked what she was doing and where she was going, her younger sister told her she was going with an older woman, who Virginia did not know. This woman was later tracked down by another relative, however, who was told that Annie had possibly been taken to San Francisco and sold into the sex trade. There was also talk of a man from McCleary, Washington State, who may have been an associate of the woman Annie left with, but the details of this man are unclear. Overall, Annie's case is very murky. Few details are known about her home life or the circumstances of her disappearance and subsequent death. But what details we do know paint a very tragic picture. Annie's case is still under investigation. Anyone with any information is encouraged to contact the Josephine County Sheriff's Office on 541-474-5123. And there you have the facts. Please leave a comment down below with your own theories and speculations, and remember to like this video and subscribe to support the channel. If you're still hungry for true crime content, you can listen to the Cold Case Detective podcast by following the link below. Thank you for watching, stay alert, stay safe, and I'll see you next time.